Thanks to all of you. I appreciate uh, this uh, the wonderful collaboration that we have with the Acton Institute. Uh, those of you who are supporters of Acton, I want to thank you for your wisdom. I want to thank you for the service that you're giving to this great country. I can assure you uh, from Washington, D.C., where I live, so that you don't have to, uh, that uh, we hear your voice here. This is uh, the truly uh, one of the very few leading think tanks outside of Washington, D.C. in the country, showing the way for what state and local um, policy can do and at the national and international level at the same time. Acton Institute is a true intellectual and moral leader. It's uh, filtering up, which is the best way for ideas and ethics to flow. Uh, one of the great virtues of the American conservative movement is that it remembers that great ideas and great values filter up. They don't come down from authority, they come up from the grassroots, from the moral grassroots, which is to say from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I'm delighted to be here, and it's an honor for me to be here every single time. I've been here four or five times. I'm looking forward to the next four or five, if you'll have me. I'm talking today about The Conservative Heart, which is the book that I had that came out in July. What a privilege to be able to talk about ideas and conservative ideas, and, and indeed how, how those of us like me who consider ourselves political conservatives can be part of the solution to fight for the people who need us the most. The big point that I'm going to make for you today is that the conservative movement will only be politically successful when it has a successful examination of its conscience. And that conscience, that examination has to basically say this, did all of my work go for the benefit of people with less power than me? If the answer is no, the conservative movement or any movement will not be successful. If the answer is yes, ultimately we will prevail. And that's a question that we have in front of us. Each one of us has the opportunity to examine our conscience, to ask that about our work. For those of us as individuals, for the Acton Institute, for the American Enterprise Institute, for the Republican Party, indeed for anybody in this country, left, right, or center. That's the big point that I'm gonna make. And I'm gonna try to be a little bit more specific about how we can make the answer to that question yes. So that in the morning, after we've examined our conscience and given the right answer, we can come back ready to fight for the American people, the people who need us the most, indeed the people who've been left behind. So let's get started. Uh, in Washington, I can tell you that, uh, and, and around the country, when you talk to political conservatives, they'll tell you that, I mean, they'll say with real regret how disappointed they have been at the politics over the past 10 years. Not just disappointed because Democrats have consistently won the White House. A, I should say a Democrat has consistently won the White House. But rather, they're disappointed because it doesn't seem like even when conservatives win public office that we seem to make much progress in changing the public policies that are most worrisome to a lot of conservative Americans. Hmm. Why is this? Why is this? Well, I'm going to offer, and I do in the book, uh, a couple of facts about the American political system today. And the first is what we should truly be disappointed about. I don't think uh, that you or I, if you happen to share my politics, should be really that disappointed that Barack Obama was elected president in 2008. Let's be honest. He ran a great campaign. He offered America campaign promises fundamentally of unity and optimism. Let's be fair. That's what Americans wanted, and that's what they rewarded. Here's the source of disappointment from my point of view, and I offer this to you for your consideration. The campaign in 2008 was about unity and optimism. The governance was about pessimism and division. What we've gotten for the past eight years is executive leadership based on pessimism and division. Now, you can argue, depending on where you sit in the political spectrum, whose fault that is. You can say it's weak executive leadership that doesn't understand that optimism and unity are a choice. Or you can say it's an opposition politically that wouldn't let the president do what he wants to do. I have my views and you have yours. But the fact remains that we are an environment of pessimism and division that starts at the level of the chief executive. Many of you have been blessed with leadership responsibilities. The great pr professional privilege of my life is, is leading AEI. Huh. Some of you are, are donors to AEI, thank you. Why is it such a privilege for me to be able to do that? Because I get to be in a position of, of leading part of the conservative movement intellectually. And I can tell you that if my vantage were, if my focus were on talking, talking about the coming apocalypse all the time, it would not be an effective strategy. <laughs> if I were to say, 
Doom is here. Give to AEI now so that we can stave Doom off just a little bit longer. How many of you are going to want to support something like this? You want something optimistic. You deserve something optimistic. You need me to take happiness as a strategy. Because if I don't do that, that's not the kind of leadership that you want. Those of you who have run companies know that you can consolidate your power on the basis of division and pessimism, but it's a bad long-term strategy. Ultimately, you'll weaken your organization. You'll bring people together to their highest potential, to their greatest vocational state, only through unity and optimism. That's what good leaders do. You can only bring people to sacrifice when they need to on behalf of a greater good if you start from the premise that what we're trying to do is bring people together, is unity and it is optimism. Unity, by the way, is something that is kind of in the American zeitgeist right now because of the, the passage of the Holy Father through the United States and Cuba. And listen to what he said, what Pope Francis said when he was in the United States. His whole message was about unity, supernatural unity between God and man, but also natural unity, one person to another. That should resonate with the American spirit fundamentally. This country is based on unity. Look back one generation or two or three in your family, what are you gonna find? Riffraff is what you're gonna find. People with one direction to go and it's up, truly. For us to be real Americans, to remember the basis on which we've built our society, we have to say it's not okay to make common cause with the poor. We must remember that we are the poor. It's not a question of supporting immigrants. It's important for us to remember that we are immigrants. It's the ultimate unity on which this country is based. If we remember that, then we can remember that unity for people who disagree with each other politically is really important for this country and we need leaders who can do that. We don't have them and it starts at the top. That's my disappointment with American politics today. <laughs> so how are we gonna solve it? How are we going to demand leaders that do better for us? This is what I talk about in the conservative heart. And to bring you uh, into sort of the world that which I, I tried to create in this book, I'm gonna give you a case study of somebody who saw the circumstances like we currently see and solved the problem. Uh, the first presidential election I ever paid attention to was 1980. I was a teenager, 1980. And uh, I was growing up in a, a, a fairly liberal Democratic house in, household in Seattle, okay, which is redundant because there are like eight Republicans there. So, <coughs> uh, uh, and uh, I was paying attention to this election because there was a very curious thing happening. I, I heard from family and friends and everybody I knew that uh, Ronald Reagan was manifestly unqualified to be president and that he was a menace to the poor and to world peace. Okay? That was what the, the, com, the conventional liberal wisdom was in 1980. But this was not consistent with what I felt. This was not consistent with what I was hearing and seeing. See, Ronald Reagan appeared to me to love me. Huh. He didn't know me, of course. I never met him, never had the privilege of meeting him. Some of you did, I bet. It was something about him that didn't seem consistent with the idea of the divisive, awful, bellicose individual that I kept hearing about. And that cognitive dissonance, what I heard and what I saw, what I heard from others and what I heard from for, uh, future President Reagan himself, le led me to start questioning my assumptions, to take the conventional wisdom as not necessarily accurate. It led me on a road that ultimately that led me to become a political conservative today. And indeed, I will tell you something that is quite important to me, which is that the reason I am a political conservative is because poverty is what I care about the most. And I learned that from President Reagan. Huh. So let's think a little bit about what he was facing in 1980. <clears throat> 1980, there was a war of pessimisms in American politics. Uh, Jimmy Carter was uh, was failing in public opinion and saying that the United States was in malaise. That was his words, you remember that. Um, it was very clear that President Carter believed that America's best years were behind us. Ronald Reagan started out the campaign as did almost all of the other Republican candidates in the 1980 cycle, very pessimistically and very in a very divisive way. In other words, pessimism was answered by pessimism. <clears throat> the early part of that primary season, said basically, if you vote for the Republican, the poor will be out in the cold. If you vote for the Democrat, America will be done. <laughs> that sounds kind of like now, doesn't it? That sounds like kind of what's on offer right now, right? 
And Reagan participated in that, by the way. Reagan was, uh, was pretty negative in his rhetoric early on. But something happened about five months before Election Day, right around the time that he accepted the nomination at the Republican National Convention in Detroit. When Reagan accepted that nomination, around that time, he, he broke the model that he was, he broke the competing pessimistic iron cage that the Republicans were stuck in. He broke out actually with happiness. Reagan's idea was Morning in America. You remember that as characteristic of that campaign. It wasn't characteristic of that campaign until almost the end. <clears throat> and it was his idea. In the speech that he gave accepting the Republican nomination in Detroit, go back and read it. It's, it's a transcendentally beautiful speech. It's one of the great speeches in modern American politics. That I would recommend to your interest also, the, the beautiful speech by Lyndon Johnson kicking off the great society. Pay less attention to the policies that followed. <clears throat> Pay attention to the speech, which really was a very beautiful speech. But Ronald Reagan's speech in Detroit in 1980, I've done the content analysis in the speech. It's in the book, by the way, if you want to look at it. There's one word that occurs over and over again. <coughs> it dwarfs all other mentions. <laughs> There's one word that he says 89 times in the speech. It was people. It was people. Ronald Reagan established himself <coughs> that night in Detroit as a happy warrior because he was fighting for people, which is what happy warriors do. He inflected the campaign, he turned it around, and this is the lesson for us today. I look at the numbers and <clears throat> it's pretty bad if you're a conservative. Um, look at 2012, and if you wanna understand what happened in 2012, the presidential election in 2012, you need to understand literally one statistic. <clears throat> okay, now, in, when, when you poll people after an election, you always ask them three questions. Uh, you ask them who's a better leader, who has better ideas, and who cares more about people like you. <coughs> Romney beat President Obama in quality of leadership in public opinion. He beat President Obama in quality of ideas. He lost cares pe about people like you 80-20. You can't win the White House if you don't care about ordinary people, if you're not perceived as caring about ordinary people. Many of you, like me, know Governor Romney, he does care about people like us and he cares a lot about people who didn't even vote for him, but people weren't convinced of that fact. <clears throat> Here's a sobering statistic from 2015 from, uh, uh, and this actually I've seen in several places. Uh, do you believe that the word compassionate describes the Republican party? Hmm. Hmm. The answer is no over yes, 11 to one. <laughs> if you get rid of uh, relatives and paid staff of the Republican Party, that rounds to zero Americans who believe that the Republican Party is compassionate. That, my friends, is a problem. Without correcting that, the same thing that beat Romney will beat the next Republican candidate, and probably Hillary Clinton will be the next president of the United States. From my point of view, a sobering thought. So, how are you gonna change that? What are we gonna do to change that? Because we're the ground troops. We're the people who are responsible for conducting the affairs of the country at the citizen level. And we're the people to whom the politicians come and ask questions and ask for money, quite frankly. So what are we gonna tell them? What's the answer to this? Be more like Reagan. Huh, what did Reagan do? Reagan was a happy warrior. Reagan fought for people. We were misremember him all the time. I talk to conservatives all the time and they talk, well, what's the, what's the magic of Reagan? Reagan fought against deficits and deficits and tax and government and s bureaucracy. No, Reagan fought for people that were harmed by those things. He didn't fight against things. As a matter of fact, when we think to Reagan about what he fought most vigorously against, which was the Soviet Union, we forget that what he was really doing is he was fighting for the Russian people, not against the Soviet regime. <clears throat> you know, his most famous speech um, at the time of the Cold, when the Cold War was near its ending stages, was his tear down this wall speech. Remember when he charged, he said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall in front of the Berlin Wall. People forget that the happy warrior of Reagan accompanied that with a joke. <laughs> what was the joke? It was a great joke. I mean, it was a very Reagan joke. It was really innocent and good and wholesome, um, unlike the stuff that people tell today. Um, <clears throat> Reagan uh, said, everybody knows in, uh, in the Soviet Union, it takes 10 years to buy a car. 
So, so there was a guy, uh, he was a car enthusiast. <clears throat> he saved up his money in the factory for years. All he wanted was to buy his car. Finally, he had enough money. He went to the only car dealer in Moscow and he said, I have the money. I want my car. And the car dealer said, it'll be ready in 10 years. <clears throat> and the guy said, morning or afternoon? <clears throat> And the car dealer said, what difference does it make? And he says, well, the plumber's coming in the morning. <coughs> <laughs> See, that's the real Reagan, right? That was the real magic of it. That was the stuff that warmed your heart. Because he understood that this is a happy task. Fighting for people is something that should cheer us up. Should something that we consider to be a privilege. Hmm. You know, there are lots of examples of that today. First, let me tell you about a little bit of research. There's a wonderful set of studies uh, that's coming out of the Netherlands right now that asks, what is the market advantage to being a happy leader? So it sounds good and platitudinous when I stand up here and say, be happy, right? But no, no, no. The science tells us <coughs> if you want to win, you should be happy too. There's a, it's a unique set of studies that looks in, it takes people in the laboratory and it exposes them to leaders who are training them in particular tasks. And the only difference between the leaders, turns out it's an actor for the same set of groups, is in a one, he acts grim, and the other, he smiles and encourages people to do a good job. You take a grim leader and make him into a happy leader and everything else is the same. What do you find? The people in the experiment perform remarkably better for the happier leader and they consider that leader to be 30% more effective. Smile and be happy and you will win and you will motivate people to be better followers better citizens. This is not just good moral advice. This is highly practical advice on how you can win elections and win for the country. Hmm. There are lots of uh, practical examples of this. So you don't have to go all the way back to Ronald Reagan. My favorite these days um, is from something I really uh, authentically care about, which is pretty trivial, but I love it nonetheless, which is NFL football. Man, I mean, what would you do without it, right? <coughs> And, uh, you know, arguably, notwithstanding what's happened in the past couple of weeks, had a bad couple of weeks, but maybe the best quarterback in NFL football today is Andrew Luck. Man, it's just, there's a good reason to love the Indianapolis Colts, besides the fact that they're a great organization, they have good values and terrific players, and, and it's in a good part of the country. Andrew Luck is just a wonderful guy. Huh. What's, his, what's his secret? What's his sort of motivational secret? There was a, a, a terrific article about him in the, in the Wall Street Journal over the summer that, uh, that kind of opened, uh, pulled back the curtains on what it's like to play with Andrew Luck. It turns out that he has this thing that he does every time he gets hit. Now, if you're a quarterback, some of you are not NFL fans. If you're not NFL fans, uh, well, I sh you should be. <coughs> and... Um, <coughs> But if you don't know anything about football, the, being the quarterback is the most dangerous, scary job out there because they're huge, you know, 300-pound guys that want to flatten you all the time, right? And so he gets hit a lot. And every time he gets hit, the first thing he does is he looks at the guy who hit him and says, nice hit. It's very disconcerting. <laughs> they say that <laughs> defenders don't know what to do with it. It's, it's, uh, it's, it kind of messes with their head a little bit. But they say he actually means it. He's been doing it since high school. He honestly appreciates this. He expresses gratitude <laughs> for somebody who's doing a good job, even if it's not necessarily in his strict interest. I'm going to come back to that, uh, that concept here in a second. But that, my friends, is the happy warrior. And that is somebody who's in no small part successful because he's a happy warrior. Mm. So how do you do it? How about some practical suggestions? How do we become happier warriors, each one of us individually? How do we demand this from our policymakers? How do we suggest that they be able to instantiate this in their leadership? How do we do it? I'm going to give you two suggestions. Two suggestions actually based on, on research, <clears throat> but I hope they'll be uh, consistent with your experiences as leaders yourselves. Number one, what do happy leaders do? They serve others. <clears throat> There is a huge literature out there that talks at the very strong statistical correlation between service to your fellow man and happiness. So if you want to be happier today, and here's the interesting thing, because the, the brain is complex and nuanced. If you want to be happier today, the best advice is pretend you're happy and do what happy people do. Now, there's some of that can be really rather trivial. Um, there's a... <clears throat> Let me tell you one quite quick side note about the science of happiness, which I've written about uh, uh, to 
a very large extent. Um, there, uh, there's a, believe it or not, there's a literature about smiling out there. You can get tenure doing anything these days. And, <coughs> and the, 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 the literature on smiles, believe it or not, shows that there are 19 types of human smiles. Okay? Literally, one is associated with authentic happiness. It's called the Duchenne smile uh, that's named after a, 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 a 19th century French sociologist. The Duchenne smile has this one particular characteristic, which is to say that it's not about your mouth, it's about your eyes, right? It uses the, two, the tiny muscles up by your eye, right below your eye socket, it's called the orbicularis oculi muscles. You can't move them involuntarily. I mean, voluntarily. You can only do it if you're authentically happy. That's the tell. If you want to know if somebody's really happy, I mean, and think about it, right? I mean, happy smile? <laughs> That's not a happy smile, right? That's just a mouth, right? A happy smile, don't even look at the bottom half of the face. Look at the top half of the face, and you're going to know if somebody's happy. Okay, so what do you do if you want to be happier today? Pretend you're happier. How do you know you're happier? You have the orbicularis oculi muscles working. How do you do that? You think of something funny and look at yourself in the mirror. I promise you, and this works, because I'm a pretty melancholic guy. If I want to be happier, you know what I do? And this actually works because I've read an article about it <laughs> in an academic journal, so it must be right. <clears throat> look in the mirror first thing in the morning and laugh. Make yourself laugh in the mirror for two minutes. What happens is your brain sees the orbicularis oculi muscles working, and it changes the chemistry of your brain, works on the right side of your medial prefrontal cortex, which lights up and makes you happier. Hmm. That's how simple we are. <laughs> <laughs> we're really, I mean, we're complex machines, but it really isn't that hard to dominate this thing, right? So, okay, do what I'm saying here, that's a little example. Now take a bigger example. Act like happy people act, and you will be happier. This is good advice to leaders, and we must demand this from candidates, but it's also good advice for ourselves. And the number one thing, besides laughing in the mirror, is serving other people. The, 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 the correlation between service and happiness is really overwhelming. It's really, it's a, uh, rather amazing. Uh, uh, the literature on this talks about a number of different ways that service and, and happiness are related. The first literature on this came about uh, in the 1970s <clears throat> when psychologists started to find that when people served others, they had a, a change in their endorphin levels. In other words, they had opiates, natural opiates that were, that were they, they got high when they helped other people. And it was called the helper's high. Right now, good life advice, I guess. Although I have to say, you know, I, I went to high school with a lot of people who pretty much specialized in getting high. And uh, <clears throat> it turns out not to have been the best life advice and best life strategy. So set that one aside for a minute. Set that one aside. If that were the case, then I would give you the advice to just drink more. And that's not one of the advice I'm giving you today serve others. How does it really help us? Number one, it lowers stress hormones. This is really clear. There's a wonderful study from Duke University in which senior citizens were asked to give massages to babies. Again, tenure for anything. It's a, it's a crazy world. But this, it, it, so half the senior citizens were actually playing board games or having conversations or something. The other half, in a, in a, a random and treatment controlled study, were asked to give massages to babies. And then they didn't, they didn't check the brain chemistry of the babies. They checked the brain chemistry of the senior citizens. And what they found out was the senior citizens that were doing something nice for somebody who couldn't thank you, certainly couldn't be nice to you back, they found that their stress hormones were cut in half. <coughs> Helping other people relieves your stress and makes you happier. That's one of the connections. Another connection is what happens when you serve others and the way that you're treated. One of my favorite studies on this is, uh, is one in which a large group of people were, were, were assembled for a, 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 an experiment in England, and they were uh, asked whether or not to volunteer to help each other. A series of experiments helping each other voluntarily. Uh, and in so doing, they were connect collecting data on who helped the most. Second phase of the study, people were broken up into small groups, and they were asked to elect their leaders of these small groups. 80% of the cases, the people in the first phase were most charitable to their friends, were elected leaders in the second phase of the group. They were strangers to each other, which is to say that servant leadership is a real thing. It's not a theological construct. It's, it exists. People will see you if you're a servant. They'll see you as a leader. That's empowering. That lifts you up. That makes 
you happy. If you want to be happier today, start serving other people and you will be rewarded. Hmm. Now, there are a lot of practical suggestions on how to do this, but let me tell you the practical suggestions I made just yesterday at lunch. Yesterday at lunch, I, I, uh, I sat down, I had lunch with all of the Senate Republicans, all in one room, okay? They meet, uh, they meet monthly, and, and I spoke to them for 20 minutes, and then they went into con- conference to kill each other. <coughs> and, uh, I mean, it's a tough time. It's a tough time. What did I suggest so that they could be better servants? Here's what I suggested, and I, and, I, and I submit it to you for your consideration as well. How are you going to be a warrior for people instead of a fighter against things? Because that's what servants do. Hmm. I suggested this. From your state, get five pictures of people who are weak, people who are vulnerable, and people who either don't vote or who would never vote for you, I said. Take their pictures. Put them in your office, five of them, right? And each morning when you come in, say a little prayer for each one of those people and say, you know what patriots do? You know what leaders do? They don't fight for people who support them. They fight for people who need them. Remind yourself of that. And then when the widget manufacturers come from your state and they ask for something, right? They're gonna, pictures are gonna be sending there and they say, who's that? And you're gonna say, Those are the people I'm actually fighting for. Keeping the faces of the people is the most critical part of being a true servant because we really are not fighting for theories and we're not fighting for ideas of people. We're fighting for actual people. And if you can fight for those people who don't even give you votes and don't even write you checks, then you really are a servant. That will make you more of a happy warrior. How could that work for each one of us? You decide. Second, this is the second way for us to be happy warriors. <clears throat> One of the biggest connections that you can find in neuropsychology is that between happiness and gratitude. Very disheartening to me is when I listen to people running for president today. It doesn't matter if it's Republicans or Democrats. They're all so bummed out. Right? They look like they hate it. You know, think about it. Wouldn't it be great to have millions of people want you to be president of the United States? Can you imagine what a privilege that would be? Can you imagine how grateful you would and should be to the public or even some part of the public for wanting to consider you as the leader of the free world? Yet they don't sound that way at all. They're just trudging through it. It's like the baton death march for these guys. It's just, you know, they're... I mean, I I realize that it's not that much fun to be eating a stick of fried butter at the Iowa State Fair. I got that. But, But still, but still, they're not grateful enough. They should be more grateful, right? So how do you do that? What can you do? Again, this is a voluntary act to be grateful and therefore to be happy. How can we do that? How can we be more grateful today? Hmm. I, I kind of found the, the answer by accident one time. Um, the first, uh, it, I, I, I've written a bunch of books, but most of them nobody's ever read. And that's like, I mean, I'm an academic. And so the first five or six books I ever, re- I ever wrote were just, you know, unheralded and unread, and I didn't even read them. So, um, <clears throat> but the first book I ever wrote that people read was a book about, about charity. It was a book about, uh, about charitable giving. It was called Who Really Cares? And it was the first time I actually got to speak at the Acton Institute, as a matter of fact. And it was a book about who gives more to charity. I looked at you know, conservatives versus liberals and religious people versus secular people and old people versus young people and rich people versus poor people. Who gives? Who really, really cares the most? Not just who says they care the most, who really cares the most with, with respect to their action. And, and it got more attention than I expected. You know, I wound up on Rush Limbaugh's show, which was you know, highly disconcerting for my, my fellow faculty members at Syracuse. And, um, and uh, I started to get feedback. I started to get mail for the first time. And you know, when you're an academic, nobody ever really feeds back on your work because it's so, it's so arcane and, and, and frankly, it's not interesting to most people. But when you write something that for the very first time gets you in the public eye, people are starting to see you on TV and they start feeding back to you, it's a really weird feeling. 
because you see that people are emotionally invested in something that you did. <clears throat> so I got this long, blistering uh, uh, letter or email from a guy. I don't remember where he lived. I think he lived in Texas or something. And he said, he just telling me basically I was a fraud and I was a fascist. And he was chapter and verse. He was refuting every one of my arguments all through the book. And, uh, and I accidentally learned something from that. Why? Because uh, I, without thinking, I mean, I wrote back to the guy and I said the first thing that was on my heart. And the first thing on my heart was, you read my book? <laughs> I said, thank you. I said, thank you for reading my book. I mean, it's what I, it's what I, just, I didn't, I mean, that was the first thing I thought of because it was just amazing to me that the guy had read my book. And he wrote back to me again. He said, I ha can't, I never imagined getting this response. He was totally disarmed. I didn't mean to disarm him. I'm not that great a guy. I mean, he, he, he was, I mean, his anger was diffused completely simply because I was authentically expressing gratitude to him for serving me by, by reading through my ideas and taking them seriously enough to tell me I was a big jerk. Huh. Isn't that weird? And what that led me on was a, a process of discovery about how gratitude actually works. And what do you find? Um, it, it's very interesting on the brain science of happiness because you learn that you think that happiness and unhappiness are opposites. They're not. They actually occur in different hemispheres of the brain. Happiness is on the right, unhappiness is on the left. You can't be happy and unhappy simultaneously because they turn each other on and off. But it's not the case that happiness is the absence of unhappiness or vice versa. You actually, each one of you, could be an unusually happy and an unusually unhappy person. Hmm. Strange thing, something that we don't, re it's not like darkness is the absence of light. Happiness and unhappiness are tangibly different phenomena. But here's where the plot thickens. The part of the brain responsible for your happy cognitions, if you're feeling happy right now, the part of your brain is lighting up, is the same part of the brain that processes gratitude. Gratitude and happiness happen in the same place. They're extremely related. That's the reason that if you express gratitude, your brain will say, I feel gratitude, and that will make you feel happy, act happy, and be better. Hmm, this is the secret, my friends. So what should you do? Each morning you get into the office, Spend your first 10 minutes writing somebody an email of gratitude. Look, somebody deserves it. Somebody deserves it in your life. Somebody deserves it in your workplace. Make sure that's the first part of your routine. It's as, it's as regular as your morning coffee, is your morning gratitude. You will benefit from that, as far as I'm standing here today. That's how we do it. We express gratitude. Uh, there's, an, there's an interesting story that had a, had a real impact on me. There's a story that I read about a a, a magician, of all people. He was a magician who worked in the 1920s in vaudeville. Back in the day, the, in, in vaudeville, it was all of these, these uh, uh, curiosities and acts and you know, things. That, you know, magicians were pretty normal. There were a lot of them on vaudeville. And this one guy, he'd had this very long career, you know, 35 or 40 years, doing the same routine over and over again. People would come in from the heartland and go see a vaudeville show. And, and, and every night, he made it look like it was new. Every night it looked like it was the first time he was doing these tricks. He was apparently filled with joy of life. What was his secret? I read his secret. His secret was every night before he went out on stage, he looked in the mirror and he said, I am truly grateful for the people who are in those seats who make it possible for me to make my living doing something I love. Think about that. You know, that had a big impact on me. Why? Because you know why? Right now, Thanks to you, I get to do what I love. I am truly grateful to you. Every single one of you. I can't tell you. I mean, my heart's overflowing with gratitude to you, right? That's what makes me happy. There's, the only, there's no other way. That's what our presidential candidates need. They're looking out across the town hall meeting, and they look like they're just bummed out. Like they don't want to be there, and they're angry at everything, and they should be saying, Thank you. Thank you for, I can't believe you're here. <laughs> you read my book. That's what we need. If we have a little bit of that, that gratitude will spill out. That's what will make people happy warriors. So here's the advice. Serve others. Show gratitude. Will it win? Well, it depends. 
depends on a lot of things beyond just this that I'm talking about. But let me guarantee this to our candidates and to each one of us. It'll be better if we can actually break the competing pessimisms, iron cage, if we can get out of the prisoner's dilemma of who believes in the apocalypse harder and faster and worse, if we can have somebody who answers anger with aspiration, then we're actually, we have the possibility of having a competition that's virtuous, a competition that's good. And whoever does it, even if they lose, they'll lose happy. And there's a whole lot that's good about that. And each one of us should be grateful for it. And each one of us should work for it. And each one of us indeed can be part of it. So again, I'll express what I said just a second ago. I have real gratitude to you for this, for being here, for making it possible for me to make my living in a most, uh, in a most pleasant way. And, and especially for the work that you're doing in our movement. Thank you for supporting the Acton Institute. Thank you for your continuing, ongoing, and rising generosity to this great institution. You're helping America a lot. God bless you. <laughs> yeah. thank, uh, thank you, Arthur, very much. Thank you. Uh, we've got time for 15, 20 minutes worth of uh, questions. So all you have to do is just raise your hand, and I will run. Let's do it. We see, we have actually, we, believe it or not, we have house rules at AEI. We'll do house rules, which is to say, if you can tell me your name, and then you can put your protest statement in the form of a question. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, my, na my name is Dan Kozara, and I'm an attorney with Micah Myers. And uh, uh, you've met with Republican leaders, and I suspect you've probably met with the uh, uh, candidates for president also. Have you expressed these same concerns to them uh, as you have to us this, uh, this afternoon? And if so, what kind of a reaction have you received from, from them? Thank you for that. And, and truly a privilege for me is that I have been able to uh, meet with virtually everybody who's running for president of the United States right now on the Republican side. Um, I have not met with Mr. Trump. Um, it turns out I'm not on his speed dial. Weird. Um, but uh, what I, I think all the others, yeah, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. And, it, and indeed, I wrote the book, The Conservative Heart, not coincidentally in the year before a presidential election. I wrote it for, for uh, an audience of people that, are gonna, that, that say they want to lead our country. And I know that at least four of them, I know that at least 15 of them own it. Hmm. And at least four of them have actually read the words inside it, which is a, which is a really good thing too. And I've had a lot of feedback uh, and conversations with each one of them, uh, almost every one of them who's running. What's the reaction? They want this. They want this. They want to be happy. They, they do want to feel gratitude. They do feel like they're serving other people. But again, it's hard to break out, to, to get rid of the handcuffs. It's hard to do it. It takes courage. You know, it's funny. Um, negativity in politics is like a highly glycemic high. It's a, it has a really fast burn and it works in the, in the near term. It tends to lose in the long term. So somebody has to have the confidence that all the way to the end of the race, this can be the strategy. Ronald Reagan pretty much figured out this truth. Lyndon Johnson figured out this truth. Bill Clinton figured out this truth. And you're politicians on both sides who figured it out. Right now, there are politicians who want to break out of it. You look at Marco Rubio, he wants to break out. He's starting to, uh, Jeb Bush has said he wants to d have a, a campaign of joy or a campaign of happiness. It's tricky, it's tricky. They want to do it. John Kasich wants to talk about happy things all the time. You know, they, they don't want to be the guy who says, actually, there are five horsemen of the apocalypse. They don't, they don't want to be that guy, right? <laughs> it's just kind of easy to do is what it comes down to. So here's, here's, what I'm gonna, uh, here's what I'm, uh, my point. We're making progress. We're seeing, uh, for the first time, an authentic competition between conservative Republicans on who's most pro-poor. They've read the best scientific thinking and they agree morally with the idea that we should be happy warriors. And I'm actually extremely optimistic that once we get into 2016, we'll be into a horse race and into a general election where, believe it or not, I think the Republicans can be the side of happiness in this next election. I think that we have a, a fighting chance of making that so. And if the Republicans do, they're going to win the White House and the Senate and the House of Representatives. And they'll have a real chance to use their priorities in a way, not just to kill each other, but to do something that's really good for the American public. So uh, keep it in your prayers. <coughs> if you're a Republican, if you're not, then you know, I'm not making, not making any assumptions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, who's next? All right. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Hi, I'm Ryan Schinkel. Uh, my question is, I can see how this would, uh, what you're proposing is a change in outlook, rhetoric, uh, and uh, attitude, but I'm wondering, how can we apply it to, say, our own movement internally? Uh, Boehner has just resigned. Uh, there is a split. The Tea Party, while very vibrant, is also very, uh, not the most optimistic. Right. Uh, how do you see this applying here? I have a chapter in the book that talks about how do you move from a protest movement to a social movement. And, I, and I'll, I'm very interested in social movements, uh, partly because I'm a social scientist. Social movements are much more interesting than protest movements. Protest movements happen all the time, and they don't last very long. Protest movements are in reaction to a particular phenomenon. They're really angry, and they burn out because people can't handle listening to them for too very long. The social movements are protest movements that morph into something that's actually for, that's fighting for people instead of fighting against things. And it takes a, a number of steps that I walk through. So you can look at the sociology of these things and they all, fi they all, they, they all follow the same set of steps. Here's what the, the Tea Party and the, the, the Republican movement, the conservative Republican movement, the con as we understand it in America today, needs to do. We need to move beyond fighting against the things that are coming from the Obama administration. We need to start fighting for a positive agenda on behalf of people who are non-traditional beneficiaries of the deployment of conservative policies. That's how we do it. Now, so many good examples of this exist. I give big examples like the Civil Rights Movement, which transformed America uh, 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 unambiguously in completely positive ways that have made our lives so much better. The, and, and the Civil Rights Movement was started off as a protest movement in the 1950s, early 1960s. And by the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, was truly a social movement. There was a majoritarian moral phenomenon. And it was a positive and a good thing, too. And it brought people together. It was unity in which it brought people together. I have little examples. Nonprofit organizations that have done this. Mothers Against Drunk Drivers started off as a protest organization and wound up as a social movement to save kids. <laughs> Think about that. It's a, it has been for a long time uh, it, within the, the top five most respected nonprofit organizations in the United States. Started in a, a teenage girl's bedroom who'd been run over by a drunk driver. Hmm. Protest to social movement, and that's how we need to think about it. Again, the one operative phenomenon is if you're fighting against things, you're going in the wrong direction. If you're fighting for people, you're going in the right direction. This doesn't mean changing policies at all. Maybe some of you are driven around the bend about Obamacare, about the Affordable Care Act. You can't stand it. Drives you nuts, right? Don't fight against Obamacare. Fight for the people who are going to be adversely affected by Obamacare. Some of you are driven crazy by teachers unions. Don't fight against teachers unions. Fight for kids who are poor and receiving an inadequate education because we have an education system in this country that disproportionately benefits grown-ups instead of children. <laughs> Fight for kids, and so on and so on. Get the face of those people, and you'll be a positive set of happy warriors, and that's how we need to change the movement in, in America today. And that's what I'm talking about. When I, when I go to a Tea Party rally, that's what I talk about. <clears throat> I talk about poverty and compassion and fairness and social justice and the people we're actually trying to fight for. And it's very confusing to liberals. <clears throat> yeah. um. I'm Bob Rossi. I'm, uh, hey, Bob. I admit that I'm a federal employee, so um, we're breathing a sigh of relief today. Uh -huh. I don't know if that's good or bad, though. We'll talk about that. Okay, thanks. Yeah. <clears throat> you spoke about bro breaking out of the iron cage yep. and the uh, negativity. That becomes tough sometimes when, and it seems this is the situation, when that negativity is directed at you and it's personal and it's uh, maybe laced with a lot of falsehood, and it's uh, very, very personal. How do we respond to that in a way that is not hooking back in to the neg negativity? How, how does that happen? Um, I guess since we're talking about, you know, in the public square, in, in the public square, how, how's, how do we do that? So. Um, uh, there are two different issues. First, I want to take on the direct issue of our attitude toward federal or public sector employees. And the second, I want to talk about the unilateral negativity that public sector employees face, particularly in the conservative movement today. Those are the two things. Let's take this piecewise. Number one, <clears throat> biggest mistake we made in the conservative movement is vilifying everybody who works for the government. 
It's insane. If, you, if, our, if our objective as conservatives would be for everybody who works for the government to be either liberal or entitled and lazy, we're doing exactly the right thing. And we're leaving you out in the cold, right? You want to sa- you want to save the country? You want to fix the government? Send conservative patriots into the public service and stop insulting all people who work for government. It's nuts what we've done. The idea that it's prima facie evidence of incompetence and laziness and stupidity to work for the government is a self-defeating negative strategy that has ultimately led to the debility and, and structural weakness of the conservative movement. Look, here, here's the truth about, how, about the dynamics of government today. The, the left for 30 years has had a, a, a fundamental strategy of expanding the state. Now, again, that's not a pejorative comment. I mean, they think there's lots of good things that the state can do, so they want to expand the state. The, the, the goal of the, uh, on the right has been to starve the state. I mean, Milton Friedman, smartest guy in history of the movement, uh, wanted to said basically you got to starve the state. My friend uh, Grover Norquist has talked about making the, the government small enough so that you can drown it in a bathtub. Evocative, to be sure. Hmm. Both sides won. Both sides won. We've grown the state while we've starved the state. And the result of that is that too many Americans, they look at government service and they say, it's sprawling, it's inefficient, everything they touch turns to garbage. I mean, that's how people think right now, because both sides have won. Look, what do we need? We need an effective government that provides public goods and a safety net and compensates good, competent, honest people fairly and rewards excellence. That's what we need in this country, right? So, so what do you do when we're not there yet? Because we're not there yet, brother. We're not there yet. So what do you do? It's the same thing I do. Look, I have a leadership position in the conservative movement. I'm not Mr. Popular and all the places that I'm going. Where do I write? I have a column in the New York Times, right? You know how popular it is for a guy like me to be writing in the New York Times, right? I don't read the comments, by the way, <clears throat> right? Huh. What do you get? You get unmitigated. Now, look, I have great support for my editors and great support from the administration of the New York Times. I love them. I love them. They're terrific, right? I mean, believe it or not, they're great. But the people who are reading the paper are really, really hostile, and I think it's unfair. Because what am I talking about? What am I talking, you heard me? I'm talking about happiness. I'm talking about unity. I'm talking about brotherhood. I'm talking about doing good for people who don't even vote like us, right? That's what I'm talking about. That's my message. (laughs) So it isn't fair. Too bad. Too bad. It's not fair. You got one choice, which is to answer anger with love. That is the only thing that we can do. Every single person in this room is treated with unfairness every single day. That's just the way it is. And you can get wrapped up in the anger of the identity of what it's all about and become bitter and answer anger with anger. Doesn't work. Doesn't work for you. Doesn't work for me. Doesn't work for them. You got one choice. I know it's not right, but you answer anger with love and you're suddenly little tiny delta part of the solution. Thank you for your service. All right. Tyler Wagamaker. Um, first of all, I appreciate just uh, you echoing in many ways the Lord Jesus Christ's um, approach towards it, saying, you know, love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you. So it's, that's just biblical wisdom. That was and just coincidence I said coincidental, that. Coincidentally, yeah. You know, so, I, um, I, I thought I made it up. So, I mean, yes, like, that's uh, uh, <laughs> groundbreaking in many ways. So, <laughs> but I'm also thankful, too, because, I mean, speaking of the Lord, that— uh, in, in the Christian tradition of the Dutch Reformed Church, there is the Heidelberg Catechism, and one of the uh, um, uh, one of the questions that deals with is what is a chief form of thankfulness? It asks, and 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 it responds in many ways. Principally, it is to pray. To pray, prayer is the chief way that we can express our thankfulness. There are a lot of other ways, but a lot of it is just simply instead of looking at yourself in the mirror. Talk to the Lord. Say, Lord, you know, I'm thankful for this person, this person. So you're, you know, you're giving thanks to God in a very tangible sort of way. And so, but with a lack, my question is, with a lack of of happiness, a, a lack of of joy, perhaps too, that we see, and maybe in a broad base, is that perhaps an indicator that we as a people are just not simply praying like we used to? Have we, as a society, culture, and Christians, gotten away from just that spiritual discipline of the importance of prayer? Uh, th- that is unambiguously true. Look, we have, a, we have a real problem of spiritual hygiene in our society. 
uh, you, there's a lot of, we're, we're not, we're not maintaining ourself spiritually very well. And, and you see this all over the place. I mean, you see this in public opinion polling where you ask young people and increasingly young people say, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. That means you're neither, by the way. I um, mean, I, 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 I know the data on this. And, and, and so we have to, do, what does that mean? That means that we have to have a better job, have to do a better job, not of using our values, our spiritual values and moral values as a cudgel against people who don't agree with us, but to remember that these things are a gift. What is the secret to a happy life? Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sum it up. I'm gonna give you 50 years of social science research in four words. These are the four words that are the pillars of a happy and a good life, okay? Faith, family, community, and work. Those are the four pillars of a happy life. I mean, I get, there's ad nauseum work that shows that this is unambiguously the case. The part of your happiness under your control is your decisions on those four basic dimensions, right? So therefore, what are you gonna share with your kids? Faith, family, community, and work, man. That's what you're gonna talk about because that's your gift to your children. That's the gift to the people that you love. Yet we use those things as a weapon all the time. We talk about our, you know, our faith and, and, and your faith and my faith. And we talk about these things as if there's some, you know, we, we beat people up with it about, you know, about how people should be conducting themselves within families. I know, I know there's disagreement on this, but again, this is a gift, not a weapon. Community, what is community supposed to mean with friendship and with charity and work? Huh, this is arguably the worst one of all. Work is a sanctified thing. And, and by the way, one, one note on prayer. Work is prayer. Hmm. Prayer is not work, work is prayer. Because if you offer up everything, the greatest composer ever lived, Johann Sebastian Bach, was asked, why do you write music? Why do you write music? Why do you do your work? His answer was, the aim and final end of all music is nothing less than the glorification of God and the enjoyment of man. Work is prayer when you earn your success, when you sanctify it for the good of others, right? So if that's the case, then, then our spiritual and our ethical and our moral hygiene only can be improved when we remember the four pillars and we share them as gifts. And if we're doing anything else, we're gonna be going in the wrong direction and getting worse on the dimensions that you really eloquently summarize. All right, Arthur, Mike Ritzema. You, I think you said to the Republican Party, fight for people who need them. Fight That's for right. the people that need us. That seems at odds, that seems like liberalism. Mm -hmm. I like the spin, I believe in it. It seems like government has the answers, you are needy, yeah. uh, we will help you. Uh, and so therefore, it's, it, it seems at odds with personal responsibility the message of conservatives. Yeah, so, so it would seem. And the reason that it sounds that way is we've gotten so used to, I'm gonna fight for people like you, as only meaning I'm gonna use the tools of government to give you stuff, right? That's not what it means, right? I mean, look, I just gave you the secrets, the four secrets, right? Faith, family, community, and work. The job of government is not to create departments of faith, family, community, and work, no, no. The job of government is to make sure that all of the things that are in the way of those are out of the way. If I were president of the United States, before my feet hit the floor in the morning every day, I would say, what can I do today to make religious freedom a little bit easier? What am I gonna do today to make it easier and better to start a family? What am I going to, that's, what am I gonna get rid of that's in the way of doing that? What am I gonna do today to blow up something that's fragmenting communities? What am I gonna do today to obliterate something that disincentivizes work? The biggest, most creative thing that policymakers can do today is to destroy barriers. They have the power to destroy barriers. That's what they're there for, but they don't think about it. You know, nobody calls a congressman and says, you know, uh, don't just uh, do things, sit there. <clears throat> Nobody says that to a senator or a member of Congress. They want you to do more stuff, right? Make destroying barriers into a creative goal and suddenly we'll start to see that helping people who need us doesn't mean doing more things and spending more money. It means using positive leadership to make sure that people can lift themselves up a lot more. That's how conservatives ought to be thinking. By the way, that's how liberals ought to be thinking too, but when I'm talking to conservatives, that's what I'm telling them. Yeah, it's a tricky, it's a, and so it's not just spin. That's what we're trying to do, yep. Who's next? 
I, my name's Kathy Majestic. Hi, and, Kathy. Um, the question, uh, I have a comment and a question. The comment is that I think that the conflict that we see in the public square today between liberals and conservatives or Democrats and Republicans is more related to uh, the belief that the long term versus the short term. So in other words, it, it seems like very often conservatives, they care about people, they want to help people, but a lot of times it's like, for example, the welfare state. How do you help people? You help people become independent, and that takes a long time, mm. vers versus the argument of, here, I'm going to give you what you need today. Right. So I guess my question is, um, how do we do a better job of framing that for people? How, how do we communicate? I think, that, I think that the liberal or the Democrats um, are better at framing their argument than we mm. are. Um, I understand that, and, and it's, it's true. There are lots of cases where the conservative deployment of principles on behalf of the poor is a much harder case to make. And you know, here's a classic, here's a classic example. <clears throat> in my view, as an economist, a deeply misguided policy is a big increases in the minimum wage. Why? Not because I'm worried about what it's gonna do to businesses. I'm actually not worried about what it's gonna do to the Burger King Corporation. If we increase the minimum wage to 10, 10 an hour, $15 an hour, whatever. That's really not my concern. The problem, I, and it's not because I think it's an evil policy, it's just a messy policy. 82% of the people on the minimum wage are not poor. If you increase the minimum wage to 10, 10 an hour, it'll eliminate 500,000 jobs. And if you increase it to $15 an hour, it'll eliminate about a million and a half jobs in America. And all of those people are not people like my teenage kids. They're the poorest people in America that have the, the, most, uh, the, 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 the worst relationship with the workforce and the lowest levels of income security and the lowest levels of education. So what's the problem? When we're in the argument over this, when you share my point of view, which is that the minimum wage is a problem because it hurts the poor, I have a hard case to make. I can just do demagogic nonsense like, time to give America a raise, as if it were that easy. Wave a magic wand and nothing will happen to jobs, right? Or I can say what's written on my heart, which is, you know what? If you work hard and play by the rules, you deserve to be able to support yourself and your family because this is America and we have the money. <laughs> Two, the minimum wage doesn't do that if you're poor and especially if you're African-American and poor. So three, I have a better policy and here's what it is. And this book is a lot of, we have a lot of them at AEI. We have a whole department dedicated to making work pay expansion of the EITC, the negative tax rate, relocation vouchers. It's more complicated. The point is it's more complicated. You can't even start the argument, however, unless you're fighting on behalf of those people in earnest. Okay, now, so here's what I talk about with the, uh, the Republican candidates. You're not even gonna get started on that argument if you're the anger party. It's not gonna happen, right? You'll, the anger party ordinarily doesn't beat the envy party. The envy party in national elections beats the anger party, right? So the only way that you can ultimately beat envy and anger internally is with aspiration. People will vote for aspiration. And here's the empirical truth. It takes good leadership and takes real courage too. It takes a willingness to lose for something, which a lot of politicians kind of have a hard time with at this point. Hey, look, we all do, right? God bless them. Um, so. What does it mean? It means that you're willing to say, <clears throat> I see a better future, and I believe that you are willing to go with me to do something even if it's hard. Great leadership induces sacrifice on behalf of, uh, of uh, communities for a better future. That's actually the definition of what leadership is all about. And what you find is that aspirational leaders understand that that's what people want. Um, I do work in communities of poverty. Um, a lot of you do too. Here's something you never hear people say. By the way, this is the worst, most destructive misapprehension of conservative Republicans today. They just want their free stuff, right? That, that, never say that again, because it's not true. <laughs> it's not true, and it's not helpful. <laughs> because even if it, look, everybody's got a useless brother-in-law, right? I got it, you know, everybody's got, I know, I know you got, I know, he's like on the couch right now someplace, right? I got it, and, and uh, he wants his free stuff. Okay, f fair enough. But that's not normal. When I'm working in communities of people who've been incarcerated, people who, uh, 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 and who are trying to rehabilitate themselves and reintegrate into society, for people who are poor and multi-generations who are poor and living in public housing, nobody ever says, you know, I love having my kids see me get welfare checks instead of paychecks. 
Nobody says that. Assume they want the same things as you, but don't see the opportunities. So your challenge is to bring them the opportunities and help them to aspire. And if you're in earnest and you're serious and you bring these policies, they will respond. They've responded in the past and they will in the future. I honestly believe that that's true. And if I'm wrong, it's worth losing for. I think this is the last one. Okay, yes sir. If the effective leader is a happy warrior, explain why the negative campaigning exemplified by PACs is so effective. The, uh, the, uh, this is the highly glycemic phenomenon. So what you find is that in the very, very, very near term, negative energy can move people to do different things. That's the, so the negativity uh, works in the, in the, the, the most, uh, the short term time horizon. But the only thing that works over the long term time horizon, what I'm talking about is a year, two years, five years, 10 years, is something that is on the positive dimension. So what happens is you have to make a choice. What am I willing to trade away? Am I willing to trade away next year for this week? And a lot of politicians are effectively doing that. And that's how PACs think, by the way. The, pub the political action committees, they're not even gonna exist in a year. They're here for the next three weeks. I mean, basically, there's a, whole there's a whole branch of economics and psychology that's dedicated to addiction. Addiction is an incredibly interesting phenomenon. Why is it that you know that if you don't quit smoking, you're, you have a seven in 10 chance of dying of a smoking-related illness? Truly, that means the, 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 it's incredible. But why do people not quit smoking? Because the near term outweighs the long term in, in huge ways when you have these bunched up benefits that you're actually gonna get. That's why you need a visionary leader. That's where visionary leadership actually comes in. There's no visionary leadership that is a pack. Packs are, I mean, good or bad, you decide, sort of the antithesis of vision and leadership. They're highly tactical. They're right now. And so what you need is visionary leaders who say basically, I understand what this can do, but it's at odds with my long-term goal of what I wanna do with my career, with my campaign, and with my country. And that's how you ultimately break out. Easy for me to say, but they are hearing it from me as well. Well, speaking of gratitude, let us express gratitude to Arthur. Um, Thank you.